uh, Deuteronomy 32 and 11, as an eagle stirs up her nest. She flutter, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, and taketh them, and beareth them upon her wings. This is about the beginning of a bird's life. This is the effort that goes into launching you, if I could use that terminology, because we do want to stay within the parallel of ourselves with Scripture. Amen? Amen. I want to talk and preach about what, what applies to me. Yes. And uh, when it comes to my ministry and when it comes to my walk with God and my salvation, and I hope that everyone here realizes that God has more for you than a meager existence of existing. I'm more important than that. The world would want me to fall into what it wants me to do, but I honestly, I'm asking God, what do you want me to do? I, I, I want to I be the people, the church, an individual that, that literally walks to the beat of a different drum. So as an eagle stirs up her nest, and, and, and the reason she does that, I'm going to get into in a moment, but now I want to go over and, and, and look at Psalms 91 and 3, because it mentions uh, something that can happen to a bird in the middle of its life. What can happen to us as individuals? Be very, be very careful, and I, I want to be, and I, I want to say this: when you try to lump an entire situation and blame it on something. The church, the pastor, the saints of God, or hello? Yeah. Sometimes the, the greatest freedom is found when you take ownership yes. of your actions. That's good. That's good. If you're in a bad place spiritually, if you're in a bad place carnally, or you're just not excelling in, in, in where you should be, a lot of times it's because what you've got yourself ensnared with. Yeah. Or you hear what I'm saying? But I'm thankful we have a deliverer. Yeah. Amen. Still talking about birds here. And I, I, I really tried hard in my oldness, Brother Stamport, not to have Erica sing the song, Once Like a Bird, Prison I Dwell. I didn't want to go there. It would have been a little bit too cliche-ish. So, Sister Layla, I just refrained. <laughs> Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. In order to be delivered means you got caught. You got snagged. And then Isaiah 40 and 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Let's place our Bibles down. Let's lift up our hands. Let's talk to the Lord and ask for an impartation. Well, we need you. We love you. We've got to have you today, Lord. Without you, we can do nothing, Lord. We, In all three phases of this scripture, Lord, we need your help. At the beginning, in the middle, and in order to finish, God, we have to have you, Lord to strengthen us, to help us, Lord. God, I pray for an unction, an anointing to allow me to speak to your people words of honesty, of encouragement and deliverance, Lord, but also in the middle of our life to live for you that we can avoid that snare in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Praise God. You can be seated. I, I want to talk about a stirred nest, but a stirred nest means a flying eagle. We like the flying part. The mother eagle purposely makes her fledglings uncomfortable. Stirs up the nest, makes it uncomfortable on purpose. The Holy Ghost is to stir us up. I don't need to go there. Most of us know that. And while I'm talking about stirring the nest up, it's because we hear so much today about people's comfort zones. 
Well, I'm not comfortable doing that. I'm not comfortable here. I just, I got this and I got that. And, and you're, you're constantly seeking this place of comfort. We all establish those comfort zones in our spiritual life, sadly, as well. I'm comfortable having only ever done this or gone this far. In our natural lives, so with our spiritual lives. You know, I, I always thought it was funny when uh, people talked about, well, I don't like driving on the freeway at this time or doing this or doing that. Boy, did that, did that catch up to me real quick. Neither do I now. Uh, I just realized that, you know, my uh, motor skills and all, I just, wow, I've, I've noticed a decline. And just, I'm like, wow, it's no problem. Before, I'd be the fastest guy on the roads, weaving in and out of traffic, feel good about it. Now, I'm just like, whoo. I'm content driving Miss Daisy, if you know what I'm saying. And while there's nothing wrong with having comforts, per se, we have to be careful that our comforts don't lead to complacency. When it comes to eagle chicks, when it comes to the stirring of the nest, at around ages 11 to 14 weeks of age, the young eagles, depending on where they're at are ready to leave the nest and they're ready to fly or to fledge as the word means. But you see, the problem is that they do not realize that they're ready. They've never done it before. They're having to trust those that have gone before them that, okay, now it's time. Many of us get stuck because if we haven't done it, it's not to be done. And so the mother eagle begins the process of what is known as stirring the nest and she actually begins to make the nest smaller at times. And, and she disrupts the resting area, the comfort area. And she keeps that nest stirred up and creates an environment where the eagles are unable to rest. And she literally will take her beak and, and pick them up by the neck and move them around and, 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 and makes it to where, no, you're not just going to sit there. You're not just going to lay around. You're not just going to sit there and, and, and do nothing And this behavior would seem to be to, to the untrained eye to look, man, that's cool. Why don't you let it just sit there and feed it and, and, and pamper it and take care of it? And why don't you just let it sit there and do nothing while you cater to its every whim and, and chirp and cry? It doesn't make sense. And it looks cool because it was such a loving environment. It was such a caring environment. And, and it was such a comfortable place. And there's nothing beautiful than the mother flying off and coming back and feeding and taking care of these cute little chicks. What a wonderful, attentive mother. The fact is, is in the stirring of the nest, she's still a very attentive and loving mother. But the process has shifted and she will ultimately get to the point that if the eagles do not progress to fly on its own, that same loving mother with that same instinctive love will literally push the eagle out of the nest. It's time for you to fly. It's, it's, and I'll, I'll say it, it's time to remove the diapers. It's time for you to spiritually progress. It's time for you to become an eagle instead of someone that constantly has to be pampered and fed and catered to your ever whim and everything that you want and that you need. Now it's time for you to start building and, and working and becoming an eagle that flies with great majestic wings and power and is looked at in all because you fly. She does all this knowing that they're not only ready to fly, but they're ready to go and to do things themselves. And the eaglets just have to realize what's going on. I hope this sounds familiar to you today because there are so many times when we have to be pushed out of our comfort zones. And spiritually, most of the time, it literally has to come from the pulpit. <laughs> It's uncomfortable. 
moving forward, growing up. Spiritually progressing is not something we look for. We like the grandeur of having done so. But the moving into that element of fasting and becoming spiritually mature and submitted and willing. Whatever you ask me to do, Lord. How many are glad right now he really didn't ask you because... You're fighting to keep the down and God's wanting you to get some feathers. Really not something we enjoy talking about. Trying to fly. It's hard when that seclusion of that nest is comfortable and warm and we're catered to. And someone comes along and says, it's time for the cage door of your childhood to be open and it's time for you to grow up spiritually and go on to strong meat and become a viable, growing saint of God that's teaching and reaching and preaching and fasting and praying and becomes a pillar in the house of God. We often fear what we don't understand. And that being said, that that becomes familiar can also become fatal. And our comforts can consume us. How dare he preach something to stir me? How dare he preach something that is right in my driveway or in my neighborhood or that everybody knows I'm struggling with? Fear can paralyze us because we're being pushed to the edge of the nest. Because if you don't fly, when the eagles move off, there'll be no one to feed you. And sadly, the nest becomes all we know. The church in Philadelphia in Revelation says, I know the, your works. See, I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it. Where you have a little strength, have kept my word and not denied my name. You see, God has called each and every one of us to a specific task. I, I, know, I like how some people like to define it. Well, God didn't call me to that. Well, he didn't call you to grow up. He didn't call you to start maturing. What, what He called you to stop teaching Bible studies. He called you to stop having a real prayer life. He, he called you and said, you don't have to obey pastor because you're too old now. Or you don't need a pastor because you're too young and got parents. Isn't it funny how when we start talking about stuff like this, we want to rewrite the Bible. We, we don't say that. Like that, but we live that. You're driving home, and well, I know we said that, but that really don't apply to us. Or, you know, honey, I don't think he really, that's not for you. You, you got other things. Hmm? But you have to understand. When God calls you to a specific task, I know there's fear that makes you want to not go forward. But if he's called you somewhere, you're not going where he's not already present. Come on. That's right. I'm open to remove the fear so some people can realize God gave you those wings to fly. Amen. God didn't give you the Holy Ghost for goosebumps. He gave you the Holy Ghost to be led of the Holy Ghost. He didn't give you the Holy Ghost so you'd speak in tongues. He allowed you to speak in tongues when you got the Holy Ghost so you know that he's real and he's there and he's calling you to something greater if you're willing to get away from the sticks. From Gideon to Peter and from Moses to Paul, you have to realize there's always someone that God is leading to places no one has gone before. That hasn't changed today. As our world is stepping into places we haven't seen or haven't known, the church ought to be stepping in places like there ought to be people rising to the occasion. Yo, know, I tell you, woe is you if you talk about the good old days and miss today's God days. Woe is you if you talk about what the Holy Ghost did in your life 10 years ago, but he can't do nothing 10 minutes from now. God has called and continues to call folks out of their comforts to accomplish great things. In today's day, I ask, can that be you? Is there anyone here really ready to say, yeah, why not me? Why not? No, 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 that's to be careful now. Because in order to get there, you have to leave comfort. 
You have to leave the comfort and security of your mind and your heart and what you've done, and you literally have to step out of the nest. You've got to remember that whatever God asks of us, he will equip us to do it. God has established this exact precedent in his word. It, 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 it's funny, even coming here to this place in my walk with God, I did not know from the day I got, I didn't know the next day or the next day and then the next day. I didn't know. I just merely stepped in. Okay, God, I'm going to trust you and lead you. And I look back at the, some things we did, uh, some of the things we did with the music and with this and with that. And I know I got a lot of people that will sit on the bleachers and complain and say this and say that. But I look at where we're at today and I go, well, I'm glad someone got out of the nest. Are we finished? Are we there? No, but we're flying. But we're flying. Oh, I don't know about you. You can deny it. You can get upset about it. You can critique about the fact that, well, the nest this or this or that. And be stuck there. But I don't know about you. I'm ready to fly. I'm ready for God to give us some eagles that are willing to fly. <laughs> Go, Moses. I'll give you the words when you get there. Go, Gideon, I'll give you those 300 men when you get there. Go, Peter. Go, Paul. Go, Saint of God. Get up and fly. I'll meet you when you get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of you, see, the problem, the problem is some of you, you do have the answer for everything in your life. But your life's lived backwards. You ain't looking to go forward. You'll only do something you understand means you repeat. You're living a perpetual spiritual groundhog day. You're doing the same things. You're praying the same prayers. You're singing the same songs, reading the same scripture. You got the same opinion. Ain't nothing changed. It takes bravery. It takes courage. You see, 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 we like to read about it, Sister Sherry, the Word of God, and people doing stuff. But I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care who you are here today, he's got something amazing for you to do. If you're willing to get out of your nest, hey, oh, no, 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 because that nest is your mindset, too. Some of you got a mind just like concrete, thoroughly mixed and permanently set. Did you feel that today? You know what that feeling is? God's pushing you to the edge of the nest about this time. It's time to really live for him. God will provide what you need. Oh, young people, he'll provide what you need. Don't you, don't you let some of these people that got caught up in all they care about the things of the world and things of this. And No, no, no. There's some of you. There's going to be some Davids that rise up and some Esthers that step out. I'm going to tell you, I still believe in our young people. God will provide what you need the moment you let go of the confines of your comfort zones and carnal cages and be willing to step into the will of God. Some of you have indicted yourself with God because you talk like that, but you won't live that way. Anytime God begins to deal with you about stepping out into a difficult or hard situation, anytime he compels you to do something in the great in the kingdom of God. You can trust God will provide everything that you need to get the task accomplished. You will have what you need to get the plan and purpose that he has for you done. David needed a rock to go with his sling. God gave him five. Gideon needed men. And God gave him what he needed. Moses found himself stuck between a rock and a hard place and an oncoming army. And God gave him a Red Sea that parted. Uh, Abraham, it was a ram caught in a thicket. I don't know what it'll be for you, but you will never know if you don't step out. You will not realize that you will not see it if you don't allow God to stir up your desk and your comfort zone and make it sure everything in your life is set to be perfect and you're comfortable. You got everything you have and you have need of nothing. I'll tell you what you need. You need God to stir your nest. You will never know, you will never know the power of God if you won't abandon your cage of comfort and carnality. It really is just a matter. It really is a simple matter of stepping out of your 
comfort zone, purposely getting up early so that you can pray, purposely picking a fast day, purposely saying, I refuse to be late for prayer. I refuse to miss church. And I get it. Yeah, those affect your comfort zones. See, I'm going to tell you something right here, right now. Sadly, the violence that the kingdom of God suffers is from within the house. You got brother fighting against brother and sister fighting against sister. Saints fighting against pastor. Pastor getting mad at the saints. Devil gets to go on vacation because we're taking care of all his work. But you're okay. You're content with that because you just go home to all your comfort. All your stuff. You have to break free of comfort zone as an eagle stirs up her nest. You see, in Joshua, we're given a glimpse of how this works because when they were going to bear the ark under the Jordan, it says, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim. They just just touched the brim of the water before it stopped flowing. See, we don't want to do that now. God, give it to me and I'll give it. God, show it to me and I'll do it. It's funny. It'd be easy to critique someone like that because they look crazy. But you have to understand, we can't neglect our part. It's faith over comfort. It's to say, I want, now, now I get it, not everybody wants to be used of God. I'm going to tell you right here and right now, within the sound of my voice, here and online, there are some that are just flat. This is not going to do nothing for them. They'll hear it, they'll know it, but they ain't about to step out of their comfort zone. So this is an individual message. You're going to have to sit here and feel the presence of God, have your knowledge of the Word of God, and you're going to have to decide for yourself if you want God to stir your nest. Because then it's up to you to take that step and leave the cage. John 15 and 16 says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Oh, someone needs to bear some fruit and that your fruit should remain. That means you are still fruitful. When you get to the place you're not doing nothing, you become unfruitful. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Joshua 1 and 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Oh, stir the nest, Jesus. Some of the greatest advice that's ever been given is don't ever get too comfortable. One friend of mine, mentor, said it to me. This way, things are never as good as you think they are, and things are never as bad as you think they are. There's a longer you sit both physically and spiritually in comfort zone, the harder it is going to be for you to get your get yourself, get yourself up and get going. Never does that mean more to me than it does now. If I sit in the car too long, if I sit at the restaurant too long. If I do, if I'm in a sitting position too long, the longer I got to stand there and get my legs back underneath me. See, I mean, all those days when I was the fastest runner, all those days when I was picked first for sports, all those days that I would sacrifice myself on the football field or on the soccer field or whatever, volleyball, whatever we were doing, has come back to remind me, you ain't so fast now, are you? And so I got to make sure I'm careful not to get too comfortable so that I can always move. See, some of us get that atrophy in our spirit. Some people got that atrophy in their walk with God. Well, you know, it ain't worth the pain to get up and move now. It ain't worth the pain to get up and do something. You realize that I, the, see, the pain, I'm not talking about your knees. I'm talking about what you'd really have to give up because you've accumulated so much comfort that it's going to hurt to do something for Christ. What's so funny is God's never asked us to get so invested in this world. We did that. 
You created your own addiction. You created your own problem. God, God, God had absolute. You say, well, God wouldn't ask me to give that up. Well, did God ask you to get it? It's so funny. We, we, we get that way with God. Well, when God tells it, wait a minute, how much do you do what he's not telling you? Our hypocrisy is going to be the end of us because we, we, we deal with God one way in one aspect of our life. And an entire we come in here, God didn't ask me to do nothing here. Notice there's a small shift in the concept here because it reminds me that Paul understood the importance of staying uncomfortable because he realized the danger of getting comfortable and he said to the most important person, Timothy, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother, and that's great, and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded also in you. Therefore, I get it about grandma. I get it about mom. I get it about the past. But what about right now, son? You need to stir up the gift of God that's in you. Oh, what's he saying? You better be careful. You better stir it up. No, 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 no. God's not required to stir you up. Anybody full of the Holy Ghost? Stir it up. Ah, see, y'all, you see, here's the problem y'all have. I live this too. Oh, man, there ain't nothing better than sit down and a nice old lazy boy kick that chair back, drink some iced tea on a full stomach. I got toys and trinkets just like the rest of you. And if you think I'm not going to preach this just because I understand it, no, I preach this because I know what it does to me. I've seen what it's done to some of you, and I want to try to keep some people from becoming stagnant in your comfort and being caged the rest of your spiritual life. There's some people here, you haven't sung your greatest song. You've never, you haven't come close to preaching your great. You haven't reached the last soul. You're going to, yeah. But the problem is, you've traded. You've traded flying for a nest of death. You traded doing great things for God for a few accolades, some your cohabitants on this earth. You think all oh, that because people think you're great when they don't even know you. Oh, look at this. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at her. Look at him. Trying to live in a life to impress people that don't know you right in front of a God that knows you intimately and watches everything as you go by ignoring him. Oh, pastor, what are you preaching? I, it's counter to the culture to preach like this. It's counter to culture to talk us about going about the fathers. What are you doing? You're, you're really talking about being a church. You're talking about being a real you're talking. You're, you're asking me to deny myself and take up a cross. You're, you're asking me to come and follow Jesus. You're asking me to deny the world. What are you doing? Are you preaching out of the Bible, Pastor? Stop that. Get away from that. One of the greatest dangers is falling asleep in your comfort zone. And missing out on your greatest moments. Is anybody really ready? I know it's just a regular Wednesday night if he calls you tonight. Is anybody mentally and spiritually ready if he calls you tonight? Is there somebody here ready that you might be the actual cog, the actual mechanism that God causes a revival to happen at your job, at your school, in this church? Are you the, are you, if he calls you tonight, are you, if he walks by and lays a mantle on you, if he, like Jesus says, come and fall, are you really ready to leave your comfort zone if he stirs the nest in your life tonight? Or is it, mm, keep walking, Jesus. Keep stepping. Are you ready if he needs you tomorrow? Wait a minute. Is he ready if he needs you tonight? Are you prepared if he wants to fulfill the beginning of a purpose in your life right now? Oh, pastor, just stop it. Let's just get through this Wednesday night. This, I don't want this Wednesday night to count. I just want to get, get home, get some sleep, and start my day tomorrow. What are you doing? You, stop stirring the nest up. Matthew 25, and now five of them were wise, and five were foolish. And I wonder as he looks in this house tonight, who falls into what category? Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wives took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slept and slumbered. They were all sleeping. Nothing wrong with rest. 
nothing wrong with sleep. There's nothing wrong with the proper time off. But the wives had already put out the effort. The wives already made sure they had the oil. They were already aware of the dangers of sleeping without being prepared. See, the sad thing is, is if you're sleeping and you're unprepared. If you've fallen asleep and you're not full of the Holy Ghost today, if you've gone, and I'm going to tell you one, you are your brother's keeper, you are your spouse's keeper, you are your children's keeper. If your children haven't prayed through, if your spouse hasn't prayed through, you can blow it off on whatever opinion you want, but you better find out and get them, hey, you ain't, you ain't been to the altar. You ain't got, you, you haven't prayed and spoken tongues and so, in fact, you know, I haven't seen you, you haven't been reading your Bible, you're reading those little token little things you get on your, your Facebook and your phone, get your Bible out, get a prayer, you're not on fire, get the oil back, honey, come on, children, get the oil back, I get it, we all need that time off, we all need a break, we all need to sleep, but before you do that, get the oil back in your vessel, get the Holy Ghost back in your life, get it stirred, stir it up. Stir it up, Timothy, Timothy, stir it up. I love you, son. I love you. I'm thankful for your grandma. I'm thankful for your baby, but I care about you, boy. Get full of the, stir it up. Turn to your neighbor, tell them to stir it up. Turn to somebody else, tell them to stir it up. Go to somebody, tell them to stir it up. Get full, get full, get full, get full. He sadly, we turn around and we think, well, I'm just, I look like just brother so-and-so coming in here and sister so See, so you can't tell about the inside. Oh, God, that just opened up a can of worms. See, sadly, I've been around long enough that I do see what leaks out from you inside. And that ain't the oil. They all slept. This whole story is a type for us to follow, to heed, to take notice of. We've got to be saints full of the Holy Ghost. You ought to be careful what comes out of your mouth. You're down in the scriptures and down in the church and down in the word of God and down in the will of God because you're at a moment of, it's messing with my comfort. Sadly, some of you are comfort, and it's not because you're full of the oil. It's because you're full of deadness, unmovable, bitterness, carnality. Don't get me wrong. Rest is not re- wrong if you're ready. Take thine ease if you know you've just been filled with the Holy Ghost. Go ahead and spend some time at rest. If you know you've been doing the work of God. Well, let's be honest. If you know you haven't, and you know you're not full, and you know your spouse or your children or your family, you know there's not. Boy, someone, someone, someone better start stirring things up. Are you able? You have to ask yourself, are you able to embrace the discomfort in order to be able to leave your comfort zone cage and hear him call you into his will? And at midnight, the cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming out. Go out to meet him. They all went out to meet. But only half were really ready. That moment, they all knew. You can't sleep if you're not ready. It'll be too late. God is looking right now for folks in this day. If he calls right now, are you ready? Are you spiritually filled or carnally comfortable? Don't get upset at my comparison tonight. Don't get upset at the truth of this fact. Get upset rather at your choices. Get upset at your comfort. Get upset at your proclivity to be carnal rather than Christ-like. Look, if you're not spiritually ready, don't hide that today. I don't care who you are. I don't, nobody has a position that, that overrides the mandate to be ready. How foolish to be looked up at, be looked at, or to esteemed when you're lost. Is... If God is dealing with you about something, 
and it makes you a little uncomfortable. Thank God. Yeah. Can you imagine if some of those without oil got a little uncomfortable? I, I can't go to sleep right now. Right. I ain't got no oil. But what do you mean? I know it says it's time to sleep. It's time to rest. But, but I didn't use my time right, and I'm not full. I, I got to go. Stop following the crowd. Stop following the crowd. Wait a minute, I got to get ready. And even if your spouse is backsliding, I've seen that, been there, done that, you got to stay full. You got to wait a minute. Even Joe better turn around and tell him, well, hold on. Thank God that he wants to nudge you. Stir your nest a little bit. Thank God he's willing to want to use you and see you fly and work through you. Paul says when in, thir- in, in Romans 13 about putting on Christ and, and do this, knowing that time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. Comfort. For now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. I, I, I got this overwhelming feeling that somebody, you, you, you're going to, you're gonna, this, this message is, someone better hear this tonight. I, I feel something, you, you, you better take this serious today. That's, that some of you, you've fallen asleep. You're so enamored with your comfort and success. You've missed being full of the Holy Ghost. Oh, Jesus. For our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. And sadly, those things exist in some of us. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for that. I don't know about you, but I've watched the American church and I'm just, we make so much provision for the flesh. But I like this, but I like that. But oh my God, I hope you like it. It's better than heaven. To fulfill its lusts. You can't put on Christ if you're wearing the world. I'm not just talking about sin. Don't try, don't, 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 don't try to simplify this. How many have caged themselves from great spiritual conquest with their carnality? How many have felt that nudge of the spirit to fly higher in the things of God, to only go back to living as usual? An amazing service, it stirs you. You know that there's some things, and yet before long, you're back to the same habits and hobbies that prioritize you and distract you away from your God give an invitation to a greater thing. You found yourself again locked in that cage built on the comforts and carnality of your proclivities. Is there really anyone here tonight wanting out of that cage of comfort? Oh, come on, Pastor. Just, just preach something that makes us all feel good about ourselves. I'm, I'm talking about those night that stand here that are really ready to make a difference. Those that are here that showed up that, you know, God is real to me and living for God is important to me. And I, in order for that to be realized and real, I've got to want to make a difference. There's got to be something that I didn't just come because uh, uh, I'm a member of this church, but I came because yes. I'm in a relationship with Jesus yes. Christ. I, I, I'm talking to those who God is looking to use and those wanting to be real disciples and leaders and spiritual giants and godly folks and those pointing to heaven. I'm talking about the, 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 the stalwart saints that we talk about in the Old Testament that you want to be those today, that he's still making those people that, that stand up and are counted, that, that go against the flow and fight against the tide of Carnival, that say, wait a minute. It's an article that was submitted to a bird magazine. You can laugh at me. And this bird owner was inquiring as to the struggle that she had about getting her bird back in its cage every night. And every time she would try to put her bird back in the cage, it would fly away from her. And the owner would have to take a towel, and I've been around macaws and some other large pet birds and 
I know how you kind of do some of this. So it kind of rang true to me a little bit. And so the owner would try to coax the bird into the cage. You know, if you can't get it, you, what you do is you take and throw a towel over it and grab it. So the question was, how do I get the bird back into the cage? I started thinking about the parallel of cages and Christians. I wonder how many times our adversary has asked the question, how do I get them back into the cage? How do I, how do I get them back into that cage? How many times has the adversary asked that about us? We're fools if we don't realize that every waking moment of our Christian lives is an adversary whose desire is to return us to the stocks and bonds that we came out of. And if you've been around any length of time, we've seen those that have gone back to the very thing they were once delivered from. Because it was a great day when we were buried. Baptism in the name of Jesus and receive the glorious gift of the Holy Ghost, evidence of speaking in tongues. It was a wonderful day when those cage doors of carnality opened and, and the sin and worldliness dropped away at those, the door swinging wide open and that, that blinding darkness of our condition was torn away from our eyes and the light exploded into our lives and, and we finally, on those first tentative wobbly steps of a child, we flew away from that, that, that cage of disbelief and death and we were excited and we were just thrilled to be in the things of God and wherever you want me to fly and whatever you want me to do we were so glad to break from those ties that 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 kept us to this world and we were so excited about what God could do excited we flew full of faith in the arms of God ready to do anything God each step we took further and further from those restrictive confines that refused us growth and nourishment and things of God. We gladly walked and talked with the Lord. Oh, I remember the newness of the, being a new convert and pushing away the old ways and spiritually watching and now with the rickiness of my body realizing that every spiritual muscle in my body that I didn't even know I had was stretched. And here I am, this new convert with this oversized Bible and long, ignorant hair and didn't know nothing and just came excitedly into the house of God, ready for the next thing to be ripped away from my life that I may fly a little yes. higher. Yes. Thankful that God stirred that nest of comfort in that cage of carnality and got me out of there. <sighs> like a new sprouting plant breaking through the earth. <laughs> Feeling those first rays of God's sunlight on my life. Ready to grow and ready to bear fruit, ready to do whatever he asked me. The splendor, the joy, the excitement, the power of liberty from exiting that cage of yes. condemnation. Yes. Yes. Church was awesome. Yes. Still I still yes. laugh. And I made it from Fairfield, California to the Napa Church. Matt and I in my Ford with a 390 in it in 11 minutes. Booming Sandy Patty or Luke Garrett at the time, just excited. And a young man excited to run in and get to the house of God. Yes. Didn't want to miss it for nothing. Was upset if something got canceled. I don't care if it was a wedding or a birthday or a party. I didn't care if it was work day, clean day, fast day, prayer day. I was going to be there. Yes. Spreading my wings in the things of God. Yes. Yes. I look now and I'm like, what am I doing here? And I remember somebody said something, and I do not say this because it's been a long flight. And someone made a statement from the youth group and said, I don't know what happened to Steve Crow, but something got a hold of him. It's funny because someone made a comment the day I got baptized, we'll see how long he lasts. So don't, 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 don't let it, don't, don't take anything anybody else on the outside takes too seriously. You still got to fly. 
And so we spread our wings and fly in the things of God. And every single day, our adversary, and I can testify every single day, our once possessive captor wants to get us to return to those things and back to that terrible cage. Don't, don't you lie to yourself. Don't kid yourself and think it's just a habit or a, a hobby. A pro- don't, 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 don't you lie to yourself. He wants you back in those bonds and chains of spiritual oppression, caught again by carnality and care. He don't want you flying in the things of God. He wants you hopping in here like a chicken. Just every now and then you get a little bit, hey, flap your wings, but go back to cluck. And every day, placing breadcrumbs of your favorite carnal desires and suddenly I got them back in that cage. No, 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 no. They're trying to fly right. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's. What was funny in the article, what the answer that was given was incredible because the answer was the bad news is that your parrot is very close to losing his complete trust in you. I would say that in the very near future, unless you fix this problem, you will have, a tr- have trained your parrot to actually hate your hands. I've seen this happen. Mm-hmm. I've seen this happen in the church. I've watched people actually dislike a move of God. complain and criticize the church. Become critical of the people and of the pastor. Hate the church. It's a burden. It's a problem. It's in the way. Yeah. The guy went on with his answer. He says, you know, you have trained a very common condition that people refer to as called random biting where your bird starts to bite you for no reason at all. You will associate your hands. Galatians talks about this, but if you bite and devour one another. Some of you sitting in this church right now had dealt with this. Okay, let me say it so y'all feel it. I've dealt with it. You can sit there and try to look all cute and quiet innocent. But you see, understand something I've seen spiritually, what some of you are really like. But I don't need to talk about that. I can just read it in Scripture. Take heed that you be not consumed one with another. Carnal people are not spiritual. Stop lying. If you can come in here and be in the heights of the things of God and step right out and nothing be changed, you're carnal. If you're not progressing and then you haven't moved in a long time and you're still the same old, doing the same old, something's happened and you've become nestled down in a dead nest, in a carnal cage, and you have a flying. And the first thing you do when you see somebody else flying is you criticize the church. Someone that wants to step into ministry, you got a complaint. Someone wants to move higher in God and you got an issue. Cigar, the church wants to step out and you're, ah, we can't. This I say then, this I say then, and he's talking to every one of us. Walk in the spirit. Walk, you better get in the spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let me say, I'm not lustful. You're carnal. If you're not fulfilling the spiritual, you are fulfilling the carnal. And these are contrary, the one to the other. So that you cannot do the things that you, it wasn't that you weren't called, it's that you're not in a position to do. Too much carnality. Carnality is a loss of flight. I may get to more of that in a minute, but he answered, and he said, I know you're trying not to do this, to make the bird angry at your hands. And you're trying to get your bird to go back without having to resort to forceful interactions, but 
Whenever a person continually uses their hands or objects to force their parrot to do something it does not want to do, it creates what we like to call the siren effect. What's the siren effect? You know that sinking feeling you get whenever a policeman pulls out right behind you, blaring its lights, and you know you were speeding? It's that kind of helpless, angry, yet ticked off feeling. You're interrupting me. I wasn't trying to be bad. It was just more important for me to do what I was doing than obey the laws. It's more important for me and comfortable for me to do what I'm doing than obey the word of God. You see, you think it's just carnality and it's not sin, but now you don't realize and the reason you feel that way is because you've been conditioned to feel that way. Because almost every time a policeman pulls behind you and sirens blazing, you usually get a ticket that costs you money. And it's a bit painful on the wallet. It's a type of emotional conditioning <laughs> that's trained you to dislike sirens, and blue lights, especially when they're behind you. <laughs> Maybe even cause you to hate cops depending on how you've been treated or been left to feel some way. And so this happens when you pair or connect sirens with bad feelings for your whole life. How does this relate to the birds? He answers it and says, whenever you are making your bird do something that it doesn't want to do, what you're actually training it to do is look for signals that predict that it's about to have a negative experience. Just like when you might look for cop cars parked near overpasses and not try to get a speeding ticket because you know you're speeding. God, just don't interrupt what I'm doing. The guy responded and he said to her, I bet your parrot hates that cow, right? That's a signal that's going to experience something negative for sure. So here we go. You ready? It's no accident that the scripture tells us to not marvel. That Satan himself is transformed into the angel of light. Our adversary understands that he cannot just grab us and drag us kicking and screaming towards the cage that we gloriously flew and came out of. Anybody remember the day Amen. when you got baptized, got full of the Holy Ghost? Anybody remember, remember the day? Anybody have the day of your spiritual birthday? Anybody know that one? Raise your hand if you know it. You have to understand that he just can't drag you, so instead he works with the subtle tricks of a master magician. And his goal is to get us back into the cage without us ever knowing we've returned. Because then when he shuts the door, it's too late. And I'm saddened that many are being coaxed back into the very cage they once came out of. Many are learning to love the hands that you should shun. Many are no longer hearing the sirens, seeing the flashing lights, and no longer recognizing the speed traps set to hinder your progress. And there's a lullaby that's being sung in the world today, and so many are falling into that spiritual sleep of deadness. Each step towards the cage, imperceptibly made because it's done on behest of something they like. A breadcrumb that led them closer, but it's not sin. I like it. Each treat and temptation that we wondrously partake of is conditioning and coaxing our return to that cage. Each breadcrumb of carnal behavior is leading us back to the cage. The book of Hebrews tells us, Wherefore, seeing also we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You see, the problem is, is there's two things set before us. What does the word aside mean, and what does the word weight mean? Aside means to put away or to put down. What is the weight? The weight is a mass 
as bending or bul bulging by its load. It's whatever is prominent, whatever is a protuberance, a bulk, a mass, a burden, a weight, an encumbrance that keeps you from pursuing what God has set in your life. With the world going to hell in a handbasket, with the harvest white and ready, where laborers are few, where Jesus is looking for those who will follow him. Are we doing what we've been called to do? We truly just, oh, we, we, we're not doing the sin, but you leave my weights. You leave my comforts. You... I'm speeding here. I don't want to hear about what God wants. I'm doing my own thing here. I don't have time for sirens. And Don't you sound the alarm, Pastor. You're getting right in the middle of my comfort zone right now. You're bothered. I'm looking bad in front of my husband. I'm, I'm looking bad in front of my My kids are realizing that, that I act one way here, but I'm all about the world. That you're, you're making me look bad. You're making me feel bad. You're messing with my mind. You're messing with my heart. There ain't nothing wrong with what I'm doing. It's not sin. Matthew 4, 19, Jesus said unto thee, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What are we gathering? What are we grabbing? What are we after? What are we pursuing? Does it talk about the things of God or is it things of self? Because the church today seems to be a group of people doing what? Is there a saint among saints here? Are you a leader? Do you hold a title? Are you spirit-filled? Can you hear what the Spirit of God is saying to his church today? Can you hear what thus saith the Lord today? Can you hear, is his word still speaking to you? Or is it just flat pages of a word that you're looking for something that you might have something cute to say or something to, oh, oh, because it's just an obligatory part of being a Christian? That, well, let's ask how much time and energy is spent spiritually flying in the things of God. Well, wait a minute. You mean I've got to do that? Or have we again caged ourselves with carnality? See, we're okay with hours of media and hours of television or iPads or phones or hours of me music and hours of entertainment. And, and, and it's okay to have a dead service. Don't ask me to pray for someone. Don't, are you really asking me to be Christian and teach? What are you, what are you doing? What are you, what are, I'm, I'm just coming to church now. I don't, I don't want to be involved. I don't want to invest in the kingdom. You're, you're actually asking me to be a Christian. You're asking me to take up my cross. What are you talking about there? How, how many are standing around at the threshold of the cage that wants to trap you, bickering, arguing about the things that allow you to fly. How many have been led back into a cage by sinister hands dropping breadcrumbs of carnality that please our flesh and you gobble it up with lustful abandon? After all, it's not sin, right? Paul said, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the lust of the, to fulfill the lust thereof. How many of us, instead of looking clearly at that cage and seeing bars of bondage, see a cage just past things that held us fast, that kept us from the intimate walk with a loving Savior. But instead of seeing the truth of that, you're looking more at nothing but the sweet, succulent treat that's leading you through the doorway. Instead of being wary of the bars, you dive headlong into the cage of restraints that keep you fast. Can't you see the danger in the breadcrumbs? Can't you see the danger in the carnality? Can't you see... Can't you see the fact that it's... it's yeah, yeah, don't point at the carnality. Point at the spirituality that's missing. Point out the fact that there's no urgency for prayer. There's no urgency to be in church. There's no urgency to reach someone. Oh, yeah, you get stirred at church now and then, but you go home and the same thing for the same years has been going on. And you can point to so many accomplishments in the world, but you look at the house of God and your hands are nowhere to be seen. You see, every single day, children are enticed in the grasp of a predator. 
the guise of fun and candy into a dark, ugly van. Moments maybe of being enticed to do something on the internet that they'll regret for the rest of their lives. For a moment of fame, you get a few likes, they'll sacrifice the ability to fly unfettered. Many of the worst serial killers in America were known as just normal people with charismatic personalities that made people, people feel at ease and comfortable in their presence, only to, like Satan, to drag them into a cage that they will never leave. Just allow the true light to dim slowly in stages, and the eyes will acclimate gradually without the brain sending the alarming signal, you're getting carnal. And by the time the darkness overcomes them, many will have been lulled to sleepwalking, will voluntarily step into the cage that they'd once been delivered gloriously from. That's the danger of a weary spirit. That's the danger of a weary mind. That's the danger of misplaced priorities. That's the danger of bitterness. That's the danger of unmet expectations. First Timothy tells us, now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. See, see the problem is some of you are looking for glory. Some of you are looking for honor. Some of you are looking for accolades. Some of you are looking at when you walk in here to be somebody. Let me tell you something, when you walk in here to make sure that he gets all the honor and all the glory forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. And he said, this charge I commit to you, Timothy. When you walk into the house of God, when you walk every day, you ought to be living glory to God. Because when you give glory to God, you don't have time for the cage. That according to the prophecy which before thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. You see, the enemy doesn't want you to think you're at war. He doesn't want you to think carnality is a part of the war. He doesn't want you to think it's not sin, so it's okay. Holding faith and a good conscience, having put away, some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Things lose clarity. The sermon is missing. Signals of deception are able to come in and have their way with you. It's funny, we're not angry at the wasted time on amusements, hobbies, and entertainment. We're not upset at the wasted time and moments that could have been life-changing and altering. You're not upset about empty altar calls and empty chairs, but you'll shoot glaring daggers at a preacher or speaker who clearly points out your error. You'll ridicule and throw vitriol at someone in the church who's falling in love with Jesus in his church. You'll tell them you don't have to do that. You really don't have to be faithful. Or maybe you won't say that or you'll come in with an excuse that the pastor's not standing and say, well, you don't really have to listen to pastor here. Or they'll ask you, why aren't you at church or this? Or you make this off errant comment, this carnal comment. Or you make this thing that, 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 that it's not sin. It's just my opinion. And you turn your back on a brother or sister who's taking the time to care about you. And they're reaching out to close the door of a cage that's about to trap you forever. And you turn your back on them. The cage door's closed. And now that bird that once chirped, that sang, that flew. One that enjoyed the pleasure and joy of liberty. It's true. Never sing again. Now clings to the recesses and dark corners of the cage, eating only the meager morsel that's placed inside. May never feel the warmth, the touch of a master's loving hands. Possibly to never feel the exhilaration of wings fed, spread, soaring on spiritual highs. And over time, long enough back in that cage, Someone can even open that door. And that broken bird will not even lift its head or take a single step. I know you's coming to an altar. Why would I leave the cage now? I'm comfortable. The cage has become home. It thongs something of yesterday. Like an exiled Israel, how will we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Bitterness takes over. They sit in a service unmoved, untouched, unmoved, and dead spirits. 
Oh, don't get excited, new convert. Don't get excited, new people. I've heard this message before. Yeah, 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 yeah. Look at the new folks fly. I used to do that, too. They'll come down to ground one day. Listen to the on fire folks sing and shout. Look at that person standing and giving God glory. I remember those days. I remember when I used to rush up to the altar call. I remember. They, 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 they'll learn. They, 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 they'll end up back in the cage of carnality soon enough and be just like me. I know I'm going long, but y'all just going to have to stick me. You need to hear me tonight. There's just a poem written by Mary Angelou, and it says, I know why the cage bird. The free bird leaps on the back of the wind and flies downstream till the current end, dips his wings in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The cage bird sings the fearful trill of a of things unknown but longed for still. And his tune is heard on a distant hill, for the cage bird sings of freedom. The free bird thinks of another breeze, and a trade went soft through the sighing trees, and the fat worms waiting on the dawn bright lawn, and he names the sky his own. But a cage bird stands on the grave of dreams. His shadow shouts on a nightmare scream. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied. So he opens his throat to sing. The cage bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but long for still. And his tune is heard on a distant hill where a cage bird sings of freedom. No, I am here tonight to stir some of you up. Not your attitude, but your anointing. To scare away that comfort and carnality for the anointing and the burden of Jesus Christ. I want to remind somebody, don't lose the song of Zion. Don't lose the song of the redeemed. And remember why we sing it. And remember why we shout. And why we are faithful. And why we show up. And why we shout, and why we dance, and once like a burden, oh yeah, like a bird, we've been set free. Sing regardless of where you are and what you feel. Make those old tired, aching bones worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Worship no matter what happens. The night may seem to last forever, but joy always comes in the morning. And if you're stuck at the back of the cage, Sing so that your master can hear just like he did with Paul and Silas and shake those doors open so you can fly again. Sing the song of Zion. Sing the song of freedom. Sing the song of liberty. Shout unto the Lord with the voice of triumph and allow the doors of that cave to spring open. Because they that wait upon the Lord shall mount up with the wings as he goes. Feel the spirit tonight and catch the thermal spirit winds to take you past the treetops into the atmosphere of the glory of God to never, never, never again return to that cage of carnality. Let's all stand. Will you fly or spiritually die? Will you ex accept the challenge or will you complain of the discomfort? Will you fly with eagles or look for comfort among the flightless chickens? The psalmist reminds us, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Surely, surely. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. Somebody has been allowed and the door set before them to fly like never before. If you're ready, if you're ready, if you're ready, if you're ready, if you're ready. You see, because it's the word, it's the Lord, he's the only one. It says, and you shall know the truth. 
and the truth shall make you free. Free to fly. Free to rejoice. Free to do as never before. Because a few verses later, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free. You know, someone here needs to fly. Someone here needs to sing. Someone needs to say goodbye to that cage. Someone needs to say, now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Carnality, you can't have me no more. Habits and hobbies and proclivities will not hold me down. I'm seeking to walk with the God of the spirit. They had joyed being cared for. They enjoyed the food being delivered daily. A bed lined and filled with the best down the two stalwart guardians could provide. The protection from anything that could ever harm them. These same two guardians with eagle eyes that could perceive the slightest movement for miles stood watch. The fledgling eaglets had really not paid attention to their development. They were consumed by the comforts that were constantly provided. They really were not concerned with their growing wingspan. They had not been aware of the strength of their wing muscles. Their feathers had grown dark and the white down had disappeared imperceptibly. Their hooked beak that aided their ability to tear into the daily provision was incredibly powerful. The claws that aided their grasp as they moved about their comfortable nest had been overlooked. They now stood tall, enjoying the development of an eagle. They could see and even anticipate the arrival of their protectors and providers. They screeched in hunger if there was any delay. They flapped their powerful wings in excitement for the approaching meal delivery. But today was different. Instead, the mother flew in and disturbed the nest. She removed the stuff down and she changed the contour of the nest and allowed protruding uncomfortable sticks and limbs to impair their ability to find a comfortable place. So the eaglets moved and perched themselves on the side. And instead of a meal, that once diligent provider hovered over them and caused great gusts of wind to dislodge them and make it impossible for them to remain comfortable in the nest. The day had arrived. It was time. Time to put all those tools and those abilities and those things they could gloat about, those achievements of growth, it was time to depart the comfortable nest. For there was waiting for them an untouched sky, a place that they'd never seen, a staggering place of the spirit with no stopping point. And I lay it to your charge tonight. It is your time to fly. It is your time to take the development that's been poured into you and to mount up with wings, wings as eagles.